Good morning, brothers and sisters. Can you hear me? I'm sitting down because from here up, I'm fine, but down the feet, I have what some people would call alligator feet. They're flat, and I can't stand too long. But then, if I'm, if I'm a diamond jubilarian, what would you expect? But thank God there's nothing wrong. I pray always that the best gift you can pray is for the mind. It's a gift and to be able to worship the Lord. Today, Father Pablo spoke to you um, a beautiful message, beautiful. And I would like to speak about the Holy Spirit and prayer. I'd like to ask the Holy Spirit to come upon us now. Lord Jesus, we adore you, we love you, and we praise you. Thank you for giving us yourself in this beautiful, beautiful sacrament of the Eucharist. Lord, what a joy to be present at the victory. And what a joy, Jesus, that you told us you would never leave us, but that you would send us your own spirit, and that your spirit would teach us everything and help us to believe and you promised that signs and wonders would follow all those who believe and speak in your name. We pray today, Lord, on this day when we dedicate to the power of prayer and to the action and grace of the Holy Spirit, that you'll really fill all of us with a great outpouring of your Spirit. We ask you, Mary, spouse of the Holy Spirit, help us not to be afraid to say yes to all that Jesus and the Father would ask us, so that the will of the Father may be fulfilled through us. We ask all of this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Now, you know, brothers and sisters, that one of the greatest enemies to the gospel from the very beginning is fear. And when you look at the 12 apostles, you know, Jesus handpicked them, and they were the first witnesses of all kinds of miracles, not just healings, but multiplication of food. They saw in, in the man Jesus, whom they yet didn't know how and who he was at the very beginning. They were drawn to follow him. And they were very, they must have been very taken with his personality. Can you imagine what Jesus, this handsome young Jewish rabbi, everybody who was looking for what something in life loved him? No different than today. People who don't want to live for the Lord disdain him. They don't want anything to do. That's why you have so many people who leave the church and who turn away because they're afraid. The best thing to do is just remove God out of your life, and then you're not responsible. That's what you think until the final day. But Jesus knew, because of original sin, that all of us were going to have all these fears, anxieties, it's all part of humanity. And he knew that those 12 men were not the best candidates to start a company. I mean, can you imagine the questions they were asking him and they were fighting who's going to be the head of them? Not much different today, you know, because people work hard to become the boss. And in my life, even in the convent, people work hard to become a mother superior. And in the church, some people would love, would love to be the bishop. If there's ambition, there's jealousy, all those things happen. And then there's a great um, trophy that Satan brings out. When you, when the Lord want, has a plan for your life, and he, want, he has a certain plan for everybody. There's nobody created that was just left there and said, well, I don't know what you're going to do, but any, here you are. 
everybody has a plan. And the plan that Jesus gave, the master plan to the disciples, was very simple. He took them with him. He taught them, sat them around and taught them. But then he put them into the school of learning. You don't, don't, it's like a nurse. You have to go into the hospital and you have to train. You have to experience the patients, what the sickness is. It takes a long time. Well, Jesus took them for three years to try and put some shape to these founders for the church. And they, they, they weren't the easiest. Remember, they had all that we get. You know, you get mad. And they got mad and said, oh, call down fire on those, but they don't believe. And they, they reacted. And Jesus was always molding them. I love where Father Pablo Wallace talks about we're unfinished. And it's like you know, the sculptor. He has to keep molding us to get us beautiful. But we resist it because it's not easy to change your opinions, to change your mind, to, to get you to recognize that your life is really not yours. It's only here for, you have it as a gift. Life is a gift. And at the end of it, it's the biggest gift of all if you live the gift as a gift for him. So at the end, Jesus said to them, I have news for you. They were all delighted following him. I mean, it was the best thing ever happened to them. <clears throat> I have news for you. I'm going to go up to Jerusalem and I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be crucified. And there's the biggest crisis. And Peter said, it's not possible. And they all were saying, oh no, that never happened to you. And then he gave them a little bit further news and he said, and what's more, if you're willing to follow me, the same is going to happen to you. Can you imagine going for a job I, I saw a great, a great uh, Mother's Day um, little uh, quote in, in YouTube the other day where the girl went for the job. This is a little sidetrack, but this is similar to what I'm trying to tell you. The girl goes for a job. And several girls are lining up for this job, and the guy says, uh, well, you have to work 12 hours a day, sometimes maybe 24. You have to um, accept that you mightn't get to eat all the time. Uh, you have to be present for the, every time the, 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 the boss needs you, and you have to put yourself at the service completely, and sometimes you'll be called for in the middle of the night, and each one is saying, that's cruelty. That's not acceptable in this society. And what's the pay? The pay is nothing. And said, what? Are you a crazy and he looked at the, uh, one by one, they all give different reactions. And then he looked at me and said, talk to your mother when you were a child. He said, that's what a mother does, a real mother. She doesn't get paid. She has to get up in the middle of the night, and the father now, I hope, and feed the baby, do things. Well, this is, you know, when you look at it like that, well, this is the way the disciples were. Because they thought they had made it. He could do miracles. He could multiply food. He could, uh, you know, just with the hands, calm storms, everything. And so it was very exciting. But then he said to them, but if you're going to follow me, you know, you'll have to suffer. The world will hate you because it hated me. And if you ever want to read how Jesus prayed for the disciples and for the church and for priests and bishops and all of us today, but especially I prayed a lot for priests, is John chapter 17. Because there's Jesus begging his father, you sent me and I am sending them out. Consecrate them in the truth. Your word is truth. The world will hate them. But I have overcome the world. These are all quotes that Jesus made. And then it comes close to the terrible suffering. They must have been devastated. Look what happened. Nobody was there except Mary and John and a few of the women. Where were all the 12? Peter denied Jesus, not because he didn't love, 
<clears throat> sometimes we forget that fear makes you do things you would never do. And that's why, <clears throat> you know, brothers and sisters, in many countries where there's great suffering on Christians and Catholics, many are, are so afraid they're so afraid because of the consequences of standing for Jesus. In this country, it's the same. There, I can guarantee you there are many politicians and people in public office, whatever level, who will not mention anything about their faith, anything about Jesus. Why? Because they're afraid of the consequences. They're afraid of losing. And that was the same with the apostles. They, so, I just remember, after the crucifixion, and after the, they started hearing that Jesus was appearing, they still didn't believe when Mary Magdalene came and said she saw him. But Jesus never lost faith in them. He knew that this was the complete portrait of a person who's living and struggling with original sin that has scarred all of us. So he was going to do something extraordinary. So he, when he appeared to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, I love that story because I can imagine the two men having a talk and saying, wasn't it wonderful? I mean, but what a disaster. He's dead. We put all that hope in him. And now they'll come back to their jobs, we'd say. And he's standing, listening to them. And I'm sure he's thinking, they didn't hear a word I told them. And then when he said to them, what are you talking about? He said, well, don't you know what's going on? What just happened? And then he did something very beautiful. He began to teach them from the scriptures. He started opening their eyes. And they loved it because, you know, brothers and sisters, a lot of Catholics think when you come to Mass that if you're in in time for the consecration, you've been to Mass. But you remember, there's two tables in every Catholic church. There's the table of the Word and there's the table of the sacrifice, of the Eucharist. And that's what he did that day. He introduced them to the Word, and their hearts started burning. Like today, all over the world, the gospel will be preached, and there will be people converted. The Word never returns to us, to God void. And then he started saying, he was so powerful that they didn't want him to leave. So what did he do? He came in with them. And at that moment, he broke the bread and their eyes were open. He had risen and they rushed back. Can you imagine the joy? He's dead to see the gruesomeness of the suffering. And then this man, in no history, no leader ever was able to do this. He was alive. And he didn't, he, he, you could touch him. He, it wasn't a spiritual resurrection. He was alive. He was flesh and blood. Then he told them these words. Well, I have to leave you. After the resurrection, we just went through. He said, when they had come together, they asked him, is it now that you will restore the kingdom of Israel? They still had it in their mind about being a king and a different king that they were going to experience. And Jesus said, and he answered, it is not for you to know the time or the place that is what the Father has lit, fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, throughout the boundaries of Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the world. And he said, then he told them, these are some of the quotes that I, I wrote down, you know, when I was praying about this talk. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. That's what Jesus says to us. God sent 
his son, Jesus, to liberate us, to free us from Satan. And then he said to the disciples, and we today in the, this age are the disciples. We have a mission, every one of us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's, you shall be my witnesses. And what are we supposed to witness to? We are supposed to witness that Jesus is alive, that, that Jesus is the Lord and Savior, and the blueprint for the, for the preacher, for example, here in America, we have this year of the revival of the Eucharist, um, Eucharistic revival, and we have many beautiful uh, teachings and all kinds of events to renew people's love for the Eucharist because many people don't believe that it's the real body and blood of Jesus. Well, in the same way, you and I have to be witnesses. He told us to go into the whole world and preach the gospel. And see, our tendency is to say, oh, you know, I couldn't do that. I'm not qualified. I, I, oh, no, there's no way I would be able to do that. Or we say, well, I have a family of children, I have a husband, or, you know, I'm very busy, and I, there's no way that I could get involved in, in anything like that, that witnessing or in the church. And Jesus would tell you, I'm not asking you to go out like Father Pablo and Sister Bridge. You have an obligation to tell people about Jesus. And this is what is wrong in Ireland, in America. You know, you know who's evangelizing our young people? They're not being witnessed to by, by us. They're being witnessed to by all kinds of groups who have their own agenda. And they disdain Jesus. They disdain the Catholic faith. And so what do we do? We say, oh, it's terrible. Or it's like in, in families, it's, it's not easy to witness to your own. It's not easy to say, I don't agree with, that's not Jesus' way. Or it's not easy when the Lord calls you to do something and you think, I'm not going to do that. I wouldn't have the courage. And I'm going to tell you a few stories, and I hope Dan won't mind me, because this girl is a perfect example of somebody who had to do something, her and Damien, that in my eyes and in yours, she was absolutely crazy. Now, one day, you don't mind me telling the EU, one day, Father Pablo, Father Kevin, her brother, worked with me for 43 years. Great priest, great sense of humor. But very, he would say, very practical and down to earth. So one day he picks up the newspaper and Dana was living with her husband and four children over in Birmingham, Alabama. And he reads, Dana Rosemary Scalling running for president of, running for the presidency of Ireland. And Father Kevin said, in the name of God, what's gone wrong with my sister-in-law? She's living in America, and she's going to run for the president of Ireland. So he went on a mission, and one thing the mission was, was to talk to Dana, and he said, that's going to be terrible. I mean, she doesn't have the qualifications, and those politicians in Ireland, they lead her up, and she'll never... Everything you can imagine, he talked to me, the two of us talked about. So he goes on a mission, and I'll never forget it, because he meets Dana, I think in Ireland, and Dan, very gently, she said, yes, yes, I'm running for me. Yeah, the Lord asked me to. And, 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 and what's more, Father Kevin, I'm not going to win. I'm going to lose, but I have to run. And he thought, this is it. So Dan goes to Ireland. Now, when the Holy Spirit wants something, sometimes he goes a roundabout way, but he never fails. So she goes to Ireland, and she has to get 22 candidate, or what do you call them, county councillors, to get her on a ballot even to get, which she did. And she was on all these talk shows where you'd be scared stiff to go. They ask you all these questions. She, we were spellbound because we knew Dana and we knew she didn't have a political background. And all. 
we pr I prayed more prayers and then I felt the Lord said, but don't you trust me? You see, I have a plan. She didn't win. And Father Kevin said, in the name of God, she knew she wasn't going to win, but she got a lot of votes, a lot. And a lot of young people loved her and were all delighted. About three months later, they sent her as a member to the European Parliament because being president of Ireland is a figurehead. You have no, no say, you just open things and present, go represent your country, but you have no power. But she went to the European Union to be a member of the European Parliament. And about six months after she was there, I um, met this ambassador who was in the European Parliament, and he didn't know that I knew Diana. And he said to me, Sister Breach, I have to tell you, there's an Irish woman came in, she's one of the new candidates representing Ireland. And he said, let me tell you, she definitely, and he was a good holy man and a good pro-life man, he said, she's definitely sent by God into this parliament because she's fearless. What she, he talked about what she did. But the only thing I can tell you is that she had such an impact on, on some of the decisions that were going to be made for Ireland by the European Union. That through her yes to Jesus, she was able to prevent it. Not with a lot of support in the church in Ireland, and Cardinal Ratzinger, it's not known, but Cardinal Ratzinger gave her the highest award for pro-life ever given in the church because she was one of the great gifts God gave the church was that it was the, 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 the passing, passing these clauses into our constitution, which were stopped. Eventually, people put them in, but then it was used by God, and everybody knew it. Now, why do I tell you that? Because can you imagine that God could take somebody that was a mother and a housewife and a great singer and in that way and take her all the way out of Alabama over to Ireland so that he could use her in Europe? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. There is nothing God can't accomplish. And this is why some of the, the requirements to be a witness the first requirement to be a witness, I wrote it down, is to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Because how can you talk about Jesus if you don't know him and if you don't have that courage, you know, to, to, to speak about him? So to, I, I wrote down here, being a witness to Jesus, personal holiness, and being convinced. You know, one of the things I say to priests, and I love the priesthood, I've been working 50 years now with priests and bishops around the world, and we've had Father Pablo, in a short time we've been in several countries, we've had hundreds and thousands of priests. But the one thing I'd say, and I'd say it here in America, and in Ireland, I often look at the gifts that priests have and what God has given them. But the one thing they need is a good, good skills in marketing. To market the gospel, you need to be convinced. And we all need, you see, that's what's wrong with us in the Catholic Church. People are scared stiff to say to a person when they ask you, yes, I'm a Catholic. Yes, this is the body and blood of Jesus. You know, I, in these years, have said to people that when I preach in stadiums and places, I said, you know, this host is Jesus. And say, well, sister, I don't really think I have the same belief in it as you. I said, Jesus said it. So if Jesus said it, I'm in good company. He's the one that gave us his own body and blood. And I, I keep saying, it will bring healing to you. It will change your life. And sometimes I'm very bold and when they tell me, not because I don't believe in other Christians, of course, to believe in Jesus is a wonderful gift. But you know, to believe in Jesus, when he founded the church, <coughs> he, there was one big ship out on the sea, the Catholic church, only one, 
Jesus said, he, he, when he gave Peter the keys, he said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, which was Peter, I build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So never worry the church is going to die. It's not going to die. It's not going away until Jesus comes back. But down through history, something happened. And we deny this often. We, 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 we think, oh, we can't say that. All of a sudden, people on the ship, the people in Jesus' company that were there in the church, disagreed. And they said, oh, I couldn't accept that teaching. At the Eucharist, when Jesus spoke about the Eucharist, that I couldn't accept that. And they left him. He did not say, oh, don't leave. Oh, come on, don't leave me. Lord, I'll, I don't really mean that. I'll put it another way that it's easier for you to believe. He never said a thing. He said, let them go. And he looked at the disciples and said, do you do want to go? And he didn't compromise. He just told it it was. Well, you see, what happened to us in history was that these people decided, like Henry VIII, Luther, all these, decided, I couldn't accept that. I'm going to find my own church. And so uh, uh, my people will believe in what I believe. And so what did they do? They jumped off ship, and there's barges. You know what a barge is? And they're good people, and I'm not condemned, because I, I tell you, if you're a Baptist, be the best Baptist. But if you were a Catholic, get back on the ship. And anyway, I, I say this all the time, look at The prayer of Jesus was that we'll all be one. Right now, on the street where my Jackie lives, we have about seven, eight, nine churches. And they all believe different things. So somebody's right and somebody's wrong. So you have to ask yourself, as a Catholic, this is why to be a witness, you're never going to witness to Jesus if you're, you're not sure. Like, you know, uh, and I'll tell you the humorous story because I've told it many times. A lovely lady called me on Skype when during COVID, I think around COVID time, and I pray, was praying when she had all kinds of sicknesses. So I took it. She was Catholic. And so I said to her, Annie, you know, get the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. It's a wonderful sacrament. And I said, you know, it's Jesus' healing power through the priest. And I said, get, go to Mass every day if you can and get, she lived close to a church. She told me, oh, loads of churches, sister. She said, I said, you know, go to Mass and get Holy Communion. And when, it's, when you're receiving the Eucharist, it's a blood transfusion for your cancer and your psych, everything. And she was oohing and on at the other end of the phone. Said, oh, that beautiful sister. Oh, how exciting. But sister, I'm a Southern Baptist. So I said to her, Anne, you're on the wrong ship. I said, you should, get, you should take instructions. You should come because she's nobody ever told me. She said, I never heard it before. And then I said to her, well, you should really look into it because I said, all the sacraments are there since the beginning and they're, the sacraments are instituted by Jesus himself. So she says to me, and my husband is the Southern Baptist pastor. Oh, I said, tell him too. Three weeks later, she phoned me up. She said, Sister Bridge, I went to investigate and I have one foot on the ship. And she said, I'd taken the RCIA. Now, all I did was witness to her my faith. But that's what it means to be a witness. You have to do it in a gentle way. And, you, you know, I don't believe in going into people's face and saying you're wrong. Or, no, I, I think, you know, people who love Jesus and who have the Spirit, he will give you the Holy Spirit to help you to be a witness for him. So that's the first thing. You have to be convinced. You have to believe. Don't be apologizing for your faith. Don't be apologizing for the sins of the Catholic Church. Listen, Jesus is asking you, 
we're all sinners. Like somebody said to Father Kevin, my coworker, you're a bunch of hypocrites in the Catholic Church. And he said, I know, but there's room for one more. We're all trying. The second requirement is the teachings of Jesus, the truth. To, to, to know Jesus, to know the Word of God, to have the courage, to have the courage to follow what Jesus taught us. That's the blueprint. You know, he didn't give anything. Like for the, the beginning of the church, the blueprint was, go out in my name, preach the gospel, he told him. Go out in the whole world and proclaim the good news to all creation. He said, go in my name. And he gave this list of all the things that will happen if you preach Jesus. He is the, that is the foundation of everything. Evangelization is not a program. It's a person. To evangelize, for us as Catholics, is the programs are wonderful. But if the program is not imbued with the power of the Holy Spirit and the zeal to preach Jesus, and you see, brothers and sisters, that's what Satan's doing today. You can go to Mass, true, and you can hear more about things that have nothing to do with Jesus. And that's why it's so important. Now, I'm going to finish off with two stories to you of my own experience of how the Holy Spirit listens to the heart. When you pray, sometimes you might think, oh, how's my prayer going to be answered? Well, I had two incidents which I really had took courage to do, but I did it. And the first one was one day I was sitting in the chapel in Dublin, and I think I told you this, but for those of you who are Irish, I was sitting in, in my chapel at the convent, just praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And I heard the Prime Minister of Ireland, we call him Bishop, wants to speak to you, but I want to talk to him. And I thought, oh, that's my imagination. I kept praying, it kept coming back. So I, I looked at the clock, it was a quarter past nine. I get up to leave the chapel after I'd prayed. And the phone rang. And this lady, a friend of mine, said, was talking to me, and she said, how are you? And, all. and in passing, just like making a, I said, you know, I got this unusual sense when I was praying to pray for the Taoiseach and that, that he wanted to talk to me. I said, it sounds crazy, but that the Lord wants to speak to him. Now, I don't know. I live in America. I was over in Ireland. I was just after making a 30-day retreat. I had no association, didn't even know the man. And how is it going to happen? Anyway, she said to me, well, isn't it interesting? I'm going to the capital this morning. I have a meeting with the Taoiseach. Now the chances. So she went there, and she said to me, I'm going to tell him. Oh, I said, don't tell him anything, because I have nothing to say to him. I had nothing to say to him. So that afternoon, she called me, and she said, let me tell you what happened. She said, when I went there, I, t I was talking to the Taoiseach, and I said to him, Sister Breach McKenna. And he said, oh, my God, Sister Breach McKenna. <clears throat> and she said to him, why are you acting like that? Do you know her? He said, no, but at a quarter past nine, and that's when I looked at the clock, I put my head on the desk, here. And I said, you know, Jesus, I'd love to get Sister Breach McKenna to pray with me. And she said, he said, what did she say? He, she said, I don't know what she said, but she brought your name up. So he, nothing would do that I would go there. So two days, I didn't go right away, but I prayed. And I went into the capital and he met me. I put everybody out except himself. <clears throat> I will never forget the look on his face. And he said, Sister, how did you know I have a, a bad chest problems? But he was also going as president for the European Union in a couple of weeks. And he was really worried. And he made this desire. 
He said, how did you know that I wanted to see you? So I looked at him and I said, Mr. Fisher, do you believe in the resurrection? Oh, yes, it's typical Irish. My mother was a Catholic. <laughs> yeah, of course I believe. Well, I said, do you not, if you believe in the resurrection, I was with Jesus at a quarter past nine this morning. And Jesus loves you. You made a desire. Make known the desires of your heart. I said, you made a desire, which in a way was a prayer. And Jesus, through the power of his Holy Spirit, inserted it into my soul. He told me, and I've been praying for you. He started to cry. He said, you have no idea. You have no idea what this does. He knelt down. I had a beautiful word, not an easy word for him. But that is what the Holy Spirit does. Don't think that the Acts of the Apostles have ended. The Acts of the Apostles continues in marvelous ways through us. When you get an inspiration to phone somebody, when you get an inspiration to write a letter, to bring food to somebody, to go up. I mean, I met a policeman, you know, in Dublin, uh, head of the, 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 the police force. And he told me he was walking through the streets, really good man, goes to Medjugorje a lot. He said, I was walking through the streets of Dublin and I see the biggest drug addict, and now a drug addict, who was one of the drug cartel that I was following for five years to arrest, couldn't find him. And he said, he succumbed to the drugs himself and he was lying in a doorway. I'm walking by. And he said, I looked over and I thought, I couldn't arrest him. He's in a terrible state. So we went over to that. He felt led to go over to him in the doorway and he said to him, do you want food? He wasn't able to answer. He was high on drugs. He just looked at him, glazed eyes. So he took out his rosary and he handed him. And the this guy, he was only in, you know, in his 30s, grabbed him, kissed the crucifix, and held him to his heart. And so he walked on. And he said, about two months later, he was back in Dublin, because he was down the country, in the, in the Garda headquarters in Dublin. And one of the men that he worked with, he never told anybody he did it, one of the men he worked with came over and he said, you know, Martin, Remember the guy that we followed for five years? We couldn't find him because, you know, he was bringing the drugs into Ireland and everything, and from a very good family. Well, he said, you know, he was found dead in the doorway uh, a couple of days ago or so. And he said, you know, the extraordinary thing, his mother prayed the rosary every day for him. She was an old woman of 90. And when they found him dead, he was grasping a rosary. And the mother said it, she could die now because she knew that Our Lady was holding his hand. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So I encourage you to pray, to pray to the Holy Spirit and to ask the Holy Spirit to give you courage. And whenever you get afraid, you know, the, it, it, the Spirit will teach you everything. You'll get illuminated, especially for the Eucharist, when you find hard to believe in your faith, when you find it hard to know what to do, decisions in this crazy world of ours. You know, parents come to me all the time and they say to me, Sister Breach, I don't know what to do. You know, my daughter's getting married to another woman and I don't know whether to go to this wedding. or I tell them, don't go, but pray to the Holy Spirit. Don't go. Don't do anything that's offensive to Jesus. Have the courage, and the Holy Spirit will give you such a love for that person, but don't, don't do something that's going to cause you to offend God. And you need that courage from the Holy Spirit. And so I encourage you today at adoration to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I could tell you stories of it being sent to different countries, different presidents, different places. Jesus sending me Father Pablo. I didn't know Father Pablo. And the day he arrived after Father Kevin died a couple of months later, he arrived to see me for some other reason, he thought. And Jesus spoke to me from the tabernacle and said, 
I am sending you this priest. Together you will minister to my people around the world. But the big obstacle would have been he has two bishops. But the Holy Spirit doesn't see any, When he wants something, God will remove the obstacles. Because he had a bishop in Spain, Cardinal, and he had a, a bishop in Costa Rica where he's a missionary. And I got that word, and the two bishops said yes, and we've been in 24 countries. We're only working three years, not three years. And there is no way it could have happened without the work of the Holy Spirit. So I keep praying and thanking the Holy Spirit. So I encourage you today. And I'm going to go over there now. I know I'm going to get a nice cup of coffee. I got one yesterday. So whoever gave it to me yesterday, I'd love one today. I'm going to be sitting right over there. I have uh, Luritas here and, and, and the Luritas family. I'm going, to, going to be over there with the books and I'll sign your book or say a little prayer for you. But if you got a medal, don't take another one because, you know, I need a U-Haul to bring them. But I have enough for everybody, is to say, if you get, and I'll pray for you. And tonight, we're going to talk about the power of prayer, and Father Pablo is going to speak about the Holy Spirit at a different angle, probably. So God bless you, love you, and thank you very much. Amen. As you go to meet with Sister Breach, I will sing Our Lady of Knock oh, and thank this wonderful, inspiring, and holy woman. So um, if you know it, you can sing it with me. There were people all ages gathered round the gable wall for an humble man and women little children that you call we are gathered here before you and our hearts are just the same filled with joy at such a vision as we praise your name golden rose queen of ireland all my cares and trouble cease as i need with love before you, Lady of Love, my Queen of Peace. Oh, your message was unspoken, but the truth in silence lies. So I gaze upon your vision and the truth I try to find. Here I stand with John the teacher and with Joseph at your side. And I see the love of God on the altar glorified. Golden Rose, Queen of Ireland, all my cares and troubles cease as I kneel with love before you, Lady of Nile. My queen of peace And the lamb will conquer And the woman clothed in the sun Will shine her light on everyone Yes, the lamb will conquer 
maker and the woman clothed in the sun will shine her light on everyone golden rose queen of Ireland all our cares and troubles cease as we need with love before you Our Queen of Peace, Golden Rose, Queen of Ireland, all our cares and troubles cease as we need with love before you. Our Queen of Peace.